So it's the summertime. Lenny has a red nose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're talking here about the vocabulary of Unit Four, mm -hmm. um, which is in Hansen and Quinn on pages ninety-nine and one hundred. Um, I'm just going to go through the words here. The first word is agathos, agathe, agathon, or at first real adjective, which means good. It means good in in moral ways and in physical ways. It's it's the it's the default word for and the unmarked word for good. Um, the next word is the modal particle on, which it doesn't define but says in italics used in some conditional sentences. Um, and this is a word that has no uh, semantic content. It's a it's a grammatical marker. Okay, so there is no way of translating it. What you need to understand is what its function is in particular kinds of sentences. Okay. Um, the next word is oxios, another adjective. But this one is different because it has an iota <coughs> before the os, <coughs> which means that instead of having an eta in the feminine nominative singular, accusative singular, and so forth, it has long alphas. Um, so it's oxios, oxia, oxion. Um, and they also teach you the negated form of this word, anoxios. It means worthy or worthy um, of something. And I think it's important to add, I don't know why they didn't add the genitive. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, get, you get it used with a genitive. You can also have an infinitive with it. You can say worthy to... Uh, uh, do something. To do something, to worth doing something or something like that and you do it in Greek with an infinitive. So the genitive is worthy of, you're worthy of honor, you're worthy of esteem and stuff like that. So that's the genitive that it takes. Um, you can be unworthy of the same things. The next word is arche, arches, feminine noun, uh, the first declension, uh, um, that means two very different things to us. Beginning and rule or empire. And the reason for the two wildly or weirdly different meanings is that this root means to be, meant originally be first. Mm -hmm. So if you're first, you're in charge of something and you also begin something. So that's why the, that's, that's the underlying link between beginning as the meaning of arche and rule or empire. It's the word for the Athenian empire in the latter half of the fifth century is the arche. All right, um, next word is gefura, gefuras, a word for bridge, a uh, word with no cognates that anybody knows. There's the verb didasco to teach, which we get the English word didactic from. Um, the principal parts are given in the book didasco, didaxo, or didaxa, and so forth. It's a verb um, that means the same thing as paideo, which we translate educate for no particularly good reason. Um, it's more, the more standard word for for teach, didasco. And the cool thing about didasco is that it's a it's a verb that takes two direct objects. Um, in English, yeah, both of them do. Uh, uh, in fact, and in English, um, we say teach someone Greek. And I think most people who learn grammar learn that in that sentence, someone is the indirect object, mm -hmm. and Greek is a direct object. Right, mm -hmm. um, but from a Greek point of view, they're both the direct object, so they both go in the accusative case. Okay, um, they can retain one when it's in passive voice. But we yes, learned. yeah, we haven't learned the passive yet, but when we do, there's a funny thing about them. These are the only verbs that are take a direct object when they're passive. So you can say, "I was taught Greek," and you can have a direct object. If you think about it. Other verbs it doesn't work like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are other verbs that will come to across that, that take two direct objects. Maybe you can think of some. All right, the next word is a big concept for Greeks. DK. DK is the genitive, so it's the first declension uh, feminine noun, and it means justice. Um, but it can also be something concrete, that is, uh, as the book says, a lawsuit, okay, a, pro a, 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 judicial, a judicial procedure. Um, in other words, as well as the concept of justice, the abstract concept of justice. So f derived from it are, you get two adjectives in the list, adikos, adikon. Notice that there's only uh, two endings for this. The first one, adikos, is both masculine and feminine. In the case of 
this word and the, the other is neuter. That's because it's a compound adjectives, and compound adjectives in Greek exhibit an older form of gender behavior. That's really what we're talking about here, the gender behavior. Before there was a separate masculine and a separate feminine, where there was one for animate, one form for animate, and one form for inanimate. So uh, adikos has two genders, two forms for the three genders, whereas dikaios has, which means just, this is the, not the negative word, but just, just, adikos is unjust, dikaios is just, that has three genders, dikaios, dikaia, dikaion. Notice it has an iota before the os ending, so you're going to have pres preserve the original long a, so they're not going to become the anus. <clears throat> um, the next word is the verb ethelo, principal parts ethelo, ethelesa, so, future, ethelesa, and etheleka is the perfect, which means to be willing or to wish. I think it's better to think of it as be willing, because there's a kind of passive as to the desire involved in a fellow. Um, but it, sometimes you need to translate it wish. But the cool thing about it is, is it, it's one of these words like uh, um, uh, English want or wish that takes a, an infinitive to complete the verbal meaning. So when you say, I am willing, you can sometimes just say that. Are you willing to do something? Yes, I am willing. Mm -hmm. But the person who asked you the question has an infinitive, okay? So when you say, I am willing, you've left out the infinitive because it's already been said. So essentially, it's a word that has already a little hook in it for and expects an infinitive. And that's the way it works in Greek as well. I'm willing to eat, I'm willing to run, I'm willing to do something or other. What completes the verbal idea um, is the infinitive. Okay? Um, then we have the word for if a and... We should maybe say that this, when it's yes. augmented uh -huh. in the past, it becomes an ADA. That's right. That's so right. That's tricky when you this see is, it. Yes, this is the first of the words that, that begin with a vowel. So the augment is not a, a syllabic augment, an epsilon, but you lengthen the initial vowel according to rules that I think are given in this on page 101. They give you how you augment alphas into ADAs, and the epsilons also become ADAs. So it's a little bit difficult because you can't tell whether an eta is masking an original alpha or an epsilon. But then the others are pretty straightforward. Iota becomes a long iota. That's the first vowel of a word. The first the first sound of a word is a vowel, the vowel of iota. Omicron becomes omega. Upsilon becomes long upsilon. And then with the diphthongs, I, ow, a, ao, and oi, what you do is you lengthen the the first vowel of the diphthong, the alpha or the epsilon or the omicron, and the other vowel, if it's an iota, becomes an iota subscript, or an upsilon, the upsilons hang around, at least in theory. Okay? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the only tricky thing is that when you have a vocalic augment, and in the case of imperfects or aorists, or, or pluperfects of verbs that begin with a vowel, it it's becomes okay. a lengthened form of that vowel, and um, in the case of alpha and epsilon, it's an eta. Okay. okay. Thanks for reminding me, Blasey. So next word is a, the word for if. Notice it's a word without an accent. Um, it says it's a particle. It's really a conjunction, I think, and it it um, uh, it also gives you the form on, which is just a mugging together of a with the modal particle on, okay? Um, again, what's the difference in meaning between these two? They, they both mean if. The on is there because it's a syntactic marker and you use it to distinguish different kinds of conditional sentences. Um, okay, the next word is the word de, a mera, with a long alpha. It's got a row before it, so that's why the long alpha. Um, just means the de. Um, thalata, thalates, uh, this is a, an example of a certain type of first declension noun that has a short alpha in the nominative singular feminine and an eta um, in the genitive and the dative. Then you also have that short alpha in the accusative, so it's thalaton. Remember, these are the things that are introduced to you in this lesson. When we get the verb thopto, 
thopso ethopso, which means to bury. Thopto ethopto epsopso ethopso. Et, there's no uh, perfect active form. There's a perfect middle form and an aorist passive form of it. Tethamai and tafein. We haven't learned those things yet in this lesson, but you will. Um, it's the same uh, root as you have in the English word epitaph. Mm -hmm. So the, the actual Greek root of thopto was theta alpha phi. Mm, my English letters for yeah, a second. There you go. <laughs> so, so theta alpha phi, when you combine it with the suffix yo, which is what gives you this present, the phi becomes a p, so you get thapyo, thapto becomes thaf. Thaf yo becomes thapto. So you the p becomes a phi, okay, in certain environments. What's, what happens is that uh, the other thing happens, that is the tau becomes a, the theta becomes a tau, and you retain the phi. So that's what you see in taf. Okay, so you're going to have, you, because there's a rule in Greek against having uh, a, a word begin with success, have successive syllables that begin with aspirated consonants, you mm -hmm. can't have two of them in a row. But there isn't any rule about necessarily predictable anymore about which one goes away. All right. Next thing is the particle chi toy, which is a combination of two particles, chi and toy. Okay, and uh, the, the book translates it, I think, reasonably well. And and yet, and furthermore, okay. Um, then to go with agathos, the first word in the list, we get the word for bad, kakos kake kakon, and then we get another word that means good, kalos kale kalon, but it means good, it means noble and beautiful. Okay, in that sense of good, aesthetically, if you want uh, good, as opposed to agathos, which includes that, but also includes physical and moral beauty. So this is this is um, beauty that's that's uh, basically aesthetic. Okay. Um, the next word in the list is meta, the preposition, which takes two cases, both the genitive and the accusative. And with the genitive, it means with. Um, and with the, um, with the genitive it means with, and with the accusative it means after, in the sense of um, after in time, right? And it can also mean in the sense of run after somebody. It does both of those kinds of after, mm -hmm. right? In pursuit of, in other words, not after, okay? So the way you say afterwards in Greek is meta, tauta, after these things, which is an accusative, <laughs> for instance. All right, um, the next word is a a word that that uh, um, people associate with Greek moral moral values. It's the noun moira, um, moiras, an example of a noun whose root ends with a rho, so you got long alpha preserved, and it's mm -hmm. got a short alpha, so the accent that Lisa just wrote is correct. So it's like thalata, but you have alpha throughout, no eta's. So this word means it translates it fate. It really means destiny. Okay, the only sense that, it, that um, it, of fate that it has is man's fate. In other words, death. Our destiny is ultimately to die. Okay, um, people think that Greeks are obsessed with the notion of fate controlling them and making mm -hmm. things happen. It's not true. Um, they're about the, they feel the same way that we do about fatedness. Okay. The next word is musa, which is uh, printed with a lowercase mu. Musa, um, genitive muses, I thought it's a type noun, okay, uh, hey, um, and it translates it muse. When it, it's, it's, I don't think this is correct, when it means the muse, it's capitalized, it means a goddess. It can mean a song, and then it doesn't get capitalized, okay. Um, but if it's the muse, you you it's a person, okay? It's a goddess, so should get a capital letter. All right. Uh, anios, aniu, a word for a, a young man, a male person uh, who's adolescent, usually, okay? Not a child, um, and not an adult. Notice that it's it's got the iota before the the ending. Na ani is the stem, 
So you got a long alpha there instead of an eta. So this is a noun of the type, type stratiotes, a word for soldier, that we're going to see in a moment. But because there's an iota there, instead of an eta, you got a long alpha throughout. Um, then we get the word for armor or tool, hoplon. Okay? Um, it's a neuter noun of the second declension, like ergon. Um, and the plural it means tells us that it means weapons, um, but it can mean a, a weapon in the singular as well. So um, that's not such a helpful thing. But it means in, for Greece it means this particular a particular kind of weapon uh, associated with a noun that's derived from it, hoplites, which is a, um, that'd be good to write that one down, hoplites with a long iota and an accent on the iota. Um, it means it's translated in the vocabulary with the Greek word hoplite. Okay, uh, in other words, it's a transliteration because there's no English word for this. It means a soldier who carries a certain kind of armor, and um, it's an ar this is a, a part of military technology that was invented uh, and that's part of the culture and the political organization, the social organization of the Greek city state. It's 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 armor that's meant to protect you if you're a foot soldier in a phalanx. In other words, a phalanx is a row of soldiers who, who stand next to one another in a row, and each one covers up himself, part of himself, and part of the person to his left. Mm -hmm. And so you go into battle with the human tank notion. So if you get uh, wounded or killed, uh, the, mo the idea is that the ranks keep on closing and you keep social solidarity as well as. Uh, warrior effectiveness. Okay, the two things go together. All right, next word is palai, the adverb palai, an indeclinable adverb that means long ago. Um, the adjective palaios, which isn't here, comes from it, where we get paleolithic and paleography and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the cool thing about it uh, that the book teaches you and um, other adverbs of this type is that you can put an article in front of it and you can say something like hoi palai, that's the nominative plural masculine of the word for the. So it's the long ago, z, if you want. Okay, and it means the people of long ago. If it's ta palai, it would be the things of long ago, right? So it's a way of making a noun out of an adverb by using the definite article that Greek has. So you can say hoi palai, the people of long ago, and you can oppose it to hoi nun, the word for now. I don't know if you can't remember if you had it by now. All right. We're coming to the end here. We, we've got three nouns in a row that are of the stratiotes type, including stratiotes itself. So. Stratiotes is the word for soldier. Notice that all these nouns are for, for, for they are all masculine, and they are, their meanings are definitely gen, gender specific. So, stratiotes means a soldier, a male soldier. Okay, and the genitive is stratiotu. It's a gender genitive of the second bunch of nouns. Okay, um, the next one is polites, the word for citizen, um, and and again, it's a function that um, most city states is, is um, um, taken up by males, not by females, although there's some uh, ambiguity about how that actually worked. And then there's the word poet, poietes. Okay, well, there is a famous, and uh, deservedly very famous female poet, Greek poet named Sappho, okay? Um, and she's just one of the world's greatest poets, but it's not the norm. Right? There are a couple of others. So, um, poet, poietes, stratiotes, and um, polites. Now, now we've got three more. Soon is a preposition. It takes only the dative case, and it means with. And we've had another way to express with in Greek which is by using a dative without a preposition. So if you say, I hit you with a brick, you just put the word brick in the dative. But you don't use soon for that. You use soon for a person who accompanies you. So I went into battle with Bill, 
and then you make build the object of the preposition soon. Okay, it's different from from instrument, it's accompaniment. The next word is the verb tato with two t's. Uh, principal parts are tato, taxo, etaxa. Tetacha is the perfect tetag by thing, which means to draw something, draw the, the draw people uh, as the object up in battle order, to organize people for fighting, to station them for for battle. So the English word tactics comes from this same root, and the semantics of this word are are pretty much confined to battle to fighting. So you station somebody in battle, you draw a group of people up in battle order, order and stuff like that. Um, last word is the word philos. Philos, an adjective. Philae, philon. Um, like agathos. So what does this word mean? People translate it dear, beloved, one's own. It's, it's a really important social concept in Greek. So it means people you apply to people who are near and dear to you, and uh, unlike in English, that includes your relatives in Greek. So when you say hoi philoi, the philoi, uh, in Greek it means the members of your family and your people who are your friends. So it, it, it has a, a different um, range, if you will, a different um, uh, purview than just the word friend or friendly in, in English, which is also a way that people translate. Okay? Bye-bye. Bye-bye.